Every four seconds, one person dies from using tobacco. That's eight million deaths every year. With every death, the tobacco industry must find a replacement consumer in order to keep their business alive. Tobacco and related industries are moving at a rapid speed to launch newer products, such as e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products, and prey on children and adolescents through deceptive marketing tactics. The products may be new, but for some, these tactics have been used for decades. WHO knows all too well that as long as the tobacco industry is thriving, lives will continue to be lost too soon. Across the globe, illness caused by all forms of tobacco use and the exposure to secondhand smoke threatens people's quality of life and their livelihoods. Tobacco is a key risk factor for heart disease, stroke, cancer, chronic respiratory conditions and diabetes. Diseases which lead to 15 million premature deaths every year. Smokers are also at higher risk of severe COVID-19 outcomes and death. The health, economic, social and environmental effects of the tobacco epidemic are devastating. But we are fighting back. The WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control was established to protect the health of current and future generations from the devastating effects of tobacco through a legally binding set of policies. WHO is working with partners across the globe to help countries implement the WHO FCTC on the ground. We do this by focusing on a subset of measures to help reduce the demand for tobacco, called Empower. Monitoring tobacco use and prevention policies. Protecting people from tobacco smoke. Offering help to quit tobacco use. Warning about the dangers of tobacco. Enforcing bans on tobacco advertising, promotion and sponsorship. And raising taxes on tobacco. More than 5 billion people are now protected by at least one of these measures at the highest level of achievement, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all ages. But this is not all. WHO continues to work within and outside the health sector to protect vulnerable populations and the environment. WHO also monitors industry tactics, policy progress and emergence of new products. Freedom from tobacco and nicotine makes for healthier societies, for healthier people, for generations to come. For more information, visit our website. Dear colleagues, what a great depiction of the work we do. Eight million people die every year because of the tobacco industry. And the tobacco industry needs its, to take its fair share of responsibility for these eight million deaths. It's really great that we can talk today about the misinformation and disinformation perpetuated by the industry. And it's great that you could all join us for today. Let me briefly introduce uh, the panel um, myself. I'm Dr. Rüdiger Krecher. I'm the Director for Health Promotion. My colleague, Dr. Vinay Prasad, is the unit head of the Tobacco Control Unit. And Dr. Kerstin Schotter is a technical officer in this unit. Let's now take a brief moment to watch the short video of the World No Tobacco Day 2020. I let you in on a secret. Over the years, many have bought into it without even knowing. They tell us stories to make us feel good. Time goes by, people change, but it's still there. The same old story. It might just look different. They even try to make it sound like they have healthier alternatives. They use unseen strategies with dark agendas. But the real secret is that it doesn't end there. The industry persists. It grows aggressively, like the diseases it causes. And every year, it creates 8 million new gaps in the market. And it doesn't care who fills them. Even if it's... Someone like me. The tobacco industry is targeting children and adolescents to replace the 8 million people their products kill each year. Speak out. Tobacco exposed. Did you see that at the beginning of this movie that we were just seeing? They were actually doctors in the 50s used for tobacco advertising. You can't imagine this happening today, but the tobacco industry is still doing this. 
It has gone on in the 70s and 80s when the concept of so-called mild cigarettes came up and then filters were introduced. And this was all done to influence the perception of harm of tobacco products and uh, to, to make people believe that by using filtered cigarettes or mild cigarettes, they have an exposure, a smaller exposure of uh, tobacco products and harms that they cause. And actually, this is still ongoing. Nowadays, we see new products on the market, so-called e-cigarettes or heated tobacco products. And these products are put on the market with the claim that they pose a smaller risk than compared with cigarettes. And actually, the scientific evidence is not there to substantiate these claims. But uh, Kirsten... Isn't the tobacco industry now also claiming to contribute to the Sustainable Development Goals? Yes, this is actually the case. So we see in the annual reports that many big tobacco companies put out that sustainability and the Sustainable Development Goals is a big, uh, big topic for them. And they try to uh, put the image out as them being good companies, doing something for the world and for sustainability. Uh, and they even talk about about their sustainability goal number three, which is about good health, but leaving out uh, 3.4, the target, which is the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Culture. What is especially astonishing is that the tobacco industry is talking about sustainability, while in fact their main product, tobacco products, is absolutely not sustainable. These products, tobacco when it's grown, It, uh, it creates a lot of environmental problems in all of the, of the production cycle. When we talk about agriculture and growing of the tobacco plant, it robs the soil of a lot of nutrients. There's a lot of water used for growing tobacco. And then when the tobacco has to be dried or cured, there's deforestation going on to burn wood to, to cure the tobacco. And then in the whole production process, there's a lot of environmental damage. And then talking about the end product, the cigarettes, you know, these little cigarette butts made out of plastic. When, when the tobacco smoke has been sucked through it, they're full of chemicals and toxicants. And the problem with the cigarette butts is also that they, most of them end up in our water. And then all the toxicants that are in the cigarette butts go into our water and pollute it. So a big environmental product and absolutely not sustainable. So we really see how corporate social responsibility is used by the tobacco industry to distort the picture, to paint a better picture of these companies to the general public. And I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Kassad, to tell us about other tactics that the tobacco industry is using. Please, Vinaya. There are many different tactics which the tobacco industry uses. And uh, one of the most common arguments used by the industry or their front group is to put the argument of loss of livelihoods uh, of farmers, uh, which is not founded on any scientific basis or logic. So here's an example. So this tuk-tuk campaign, when all the auto rickshaws uh, in India uh, were pasted with this picture of a tobacco-growing farmer asking for saving his livelihood, so basically a misinformation campaign by the tobacco industry and their front group to oppose the government's decision to put in large graphic health warnings on all tobacco products. So uh, this campaign was seeking support from the public and uh, trying to dislodge a very important public health measure. But Ninaya, uh, is this really what tobacco farmers look like? In reality, actually, uh, most countries where tobacco growing uh, is seen, there are a number of children working in the tobacco uh, farms. And as a result of that, Uh, these children are not able to go to school. So this has been a huge concern uh, in, in many countries. Also, many of the occupational health 
related standards are not being met. And a number of tobacco uh, farmers suffer from health and other sicknesses, uh, which is commonly known as the green tobacco sicknesses. Also, uh, women in the household where tobacco uh, leaves are kept at home suffer from uh, more, more chances of uh, abortions. So these are huge risks which uh, the community is facing, but has never been shared or uh, communicated to the rest of the world. Vinaya, how else does the tobacco industry try to confuse the public? So the tobacco industry has got uh, been playing a number of tactics in the last uh, couple of decades, uh, like paying for research and the science so that they can look to discredit uh, the evidence relating to tobacco and tobacco-related harms. Uh, similar to climate change, where they, there would be a controversy which would be created and then uh, uh, would muddy the waters. For example, many years ago, the industry came with this uh, on oath saying nicotine is not addictive. Later, when the industry documents were released, it was evident that the industry knew that nicotine was addictive and harmful. Uh, they have also been following uh, a very consistent approach in every single country to undermine tobacco control policies, challenging them in court, saying, for example, smoke-free environments could be damaging to the uh, to the economy, uh, whereas it is not so when we implement them, or uh, Raising taxes will lead to illicit trade, and the scare tactics, which is commonly been used by the tobacco industry to convince the government. Uh, of late, uh, there have been uh, efforts by the industry to uh, set up front groups. Uh, the most uh, visible one of, is the Foundation for Smoke Free World, uh, established by uh, funding from Philip Morris. And this has been uh, pushing uh, on the guise of introducing new novel products, uh, a world which is free from smoking. But the truth is that they are promoting their new tobacco products and trying to keep the addiction alive. Uh, Rudiger, uh, can you tell us how the tobacco industry is shaping social behavior and the image connected to tobacco use? Yeah, dear colleagues, we need to understand uh, that the tobacco industry does one thing very well. They study social behavior. And they use this social behavior then to manipulate uh, the market and, and to market their products. Let me give you uh, a couple of examples. Um, they, the tobacco industry segmented their target audiences to understand the attitudes and goals, and uh, then market their products to speak to those specific desires. For instance, um, for men, on the notion of masculinity, for women to be free and empowered, for children to fit in and be seen like an adult. For men, for instance, you may remember the image of the Marlboro who was the, this depiction of masculinity. For women, you may remember these slim cigarettes that were very much in fashion and still are. Um, they called torches of freedom to equate cigarette smoking as contributing to emancipation of women, marketing tactics still used uh, in low and middle income. And then the children. They are recruiting the next generation of users. And of course, then, they do the art to say, oh, you need to be dull to smoke. And guess how this speaks to children, young boys who want to be much older, young girls who want to be women older. So by saying, no, no, you need to be dull to smoke, it actually Exactly. It's so shocking to hear that children are recruited as a new generation of smokers. 
But I guess when you promote a product that kills half of your users, you have to think that way. So what about sports and entertainment industry? Are these also used to promote these products? Yeah, Kirsten, you're absolutely right. And, you know, again, we need to understand how smart the industry is, right? So they paint this picture of glamorous use of tobacco, of cigarettes. It's a sign, or they claim this and pitch it that cigarette smoking would be a sign for wealth and for strength. And of course, the opposite is true. Just look at the movies, right? So you, you go um, and buy a, 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 a movie ticket and you think you're going to see a film. Actually, what you get very often is a, a tobacco advert. In 2018, um, there were um, 18 billion times images of cigarette smokers during the film. 18 billion times. And smoking on screen, of course, kills in real. At least half of tobacco contaminated movies in 2018 were youth rated. So <laughs> this is really an interesting move because we see that um, this is increasing in movies. So the tobacco industry uses product placements and the new laws on the product placements we have in movies um, to really increase the visibility of, uh, of cigarette smoking uh, in everyday life as uh, situation. And so the movies are an ex excellent vehicle for them and something we really need to watch out for. Another thing that happens is that Formula One is promoting um, cigarettes is promoting the tobacco industry. Athletes are still promoting cigarettes. Um, of course, this, this constitutes a violation in many countries, and it's definitely, uh, of course, against uh, the, the, the FCTC, the Framework Convention, the Convention on Tobacco Control. Let me give you another example of um, Davide having uh, to withdraw from sponsoring tennis championships in the Swiss indoor. Right? So, um, we need to understand that tobacco tries to be everywhere. And it requires really our public health advocacy and knowledge to come to that. Kirsten, let me ask you, despite all this misinformation, perpetuated by the tobacco industry. WHO is fighting. Can you briefly give an overview of what we are doing? Yes, of course. So with 8 million people dying of tobacco and secondhand smoke every year, of course the WHO is fighting this huge public health uh, pandemic. In 2003, all WHO member states have adopted the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control to fight globally against tobacco use and the tobacco industry. This is a set of legal measures that countries can adopt, and if they do so, tobacco use will be reduced. And we as WHO, we are helping countries to implement the FCTC. This is the abbreviation for Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and we help countries to implement this on the ground. And to do this, we have summarized the six most effective demand reduction measures in the so-called empower measures. And these six measures, if countries adopt these at the highest level of achievement, then we know tobacco use will significantly reduce quite quickly. And this has been shown in many countries around the world. What is unfortunately happening is the tobacco industry is not sleeping. They're very resourceful and they know exactly what they have to do to fight us. So in many cases, what they do is they take countries to court. Countries, for example, they adopt a new law on pictorial health warnings or on advertising bans, and they have to defend themselves in court against the tobacco industry. 
for big countries like Australia also, they, they have the resources to defend themselves. For small countries, this is often a problem. Some countries are even intimidated. They either withdraw their laws or they don't even dare to put out these laws. And this is where we come in again. We support these countries to defend themselves and we have global partners that help us in this fight. And also what we are doing is to help countries get the information, the correct information out to countries. And one of the ways that we're doing this is to promote anti-tobacco mass media campaigns. Rudiger, maybe you want to talk more about this aspect of our work. Yes, thank you, Kirsten. And indeed, uh, the, the, the data that we receive are worrisome. 12% of 13 to 15 year olds in the world are smokers. And obviously, there's also many children smoking below the age of 13, but in many countries and most countries, these data are not drawn because of ethical reasons. 44 million children are smokers. This, this is unacceptable. And therefore, we said that the World No Tobacco Day of 2020 uh, was on this issue, that the tobacco industry recruits children to be the next generation of smokers. And we've reached 3 billion people. 3 billion people. I think no, no mass campaigner for the HR has ever reached that figure. And the reason for this being that there was an outrage. People just don't take it. And the other thing is that, of course, we used innovative um, uh, routes and innovative um, new channels to um, launch this campaign on social media um, with our communications uh, department. Excellent work on this. And so we actually uh, embarked on a counter um, strategy to this, um, uh, to this to tobacco um, um, effort to recruit children for next generation smokers. Uh, through also debunking the myths and uh, expose manipulation tactics to hook youth on nicotine and tobacco, to equip young people with knowledge and tools to protect themselves from the harms of nicotine and tobacco, and to empower influencers to defend youth and engage them in the fight. You know, what, what we want to do with these World No Tobacco Days is really to get the information that people need uh, based on evidence to protect them and to hopefully change their minds and if they are smokers, to quit smoking. It's fantastic that, that World No Tobacco Day reached so many people with so much important and trustworthy information. Rüdiger, what can these infodemic managers do to help fight misinformation about the tobacco industry? Are there some concrete examples that we can give them? Yes, of course. Um, so please, you as um, infodemic managers, you're the leaders uh, in this. Please consider including tobacco in your monitoring plans and include this to counter marketing messages that promote tobacco control and to debunk myths perpetuated by the tobacco industry in your communications campaigns, particularly in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic. Then we urge researchers, scientists, and the media to be cautious about amplifying unproven claims about nicotine and tobacco products. And we're so excited about being part of this training for the infodemic managers and to know that we have many people join us in the fight against the tobacco industry. Now, going from the managers to each one of us, and uh, we have this string diagram showing how the infodemic can be reduced. So what can each one of us do to fight the infodemic? Yes, we all can do something. The first thing is, let's all be critical when we receive information. 
uh, let us all question the source for accuracy and the evidence. When we're engaging with social media, let us only share, like, or forward content from trusted sources. And thirdly, let us all correct or call out people in our networks when they share misinformation. Direct them towards trusted sources. Colleagues, the tobacco industry will continue to sell their tobacco products, undermine tobacco control, and let us all be reminded that we don't engage with the tobacco industry. Colleagues, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. If you want to have more information, please go and visit our website. Thank you so much for listening.